Great. Okay. Well, look, we're at 30, and it's bang on 7, 7 a.m. for Sydney time. Um, and I know it's all different times around the world. So we're actually on the 18th, and I know most people in the world are on the 17th of September. So welcome. Um, and I'm glad, uh, I'm glad most, of, most people have seemed to be finding the right date for it. So again, welcome to this webinar with the topic of disseminating research output to increase audience and outreach. The webinar is being co-hosted by three hosts. Uh, that is ISPAR, the Early Career Network of ISPAR, uh, ISBUNPAR webinars, and also University of California San Diego School of Medicine. And we're delighted to have a fantastic lineup of speakers today. Um, your chairs for today's session will be uh, Dr. John Bellatier, who is based at UCSD, uh, and myself, as well as Rachel Sutherland. Uh, who, and Rachel Sutherland and I are both based at the University of Newcastle, uh, near close to Sydney in Australia. So uh, we're encouraging everyone to be social with this webinar. So um, you can share insights into what you might be seeing using the hashtag, hashtag ISPARECN on Twitter and any other social networks that you might be involved in. That would be really great to get that, the, word, the word shared. So just a, bit, a brief bit of uh, housekeeping. This webinar will be recorded um, and is available for playback via the ISPAR website, perhaps in a couple of days' time. We'll aim to get that up um, fairly, fairly quickly. And you can see there the URL to access uh, that recording. Uh, another really important thing, so we want this to be um, a really interactive session. We've got a planned question uh, time at the end of this webinar. Uh, and throughout the webinar, you can use the chat feature um, and the questions in there. So when you uh, look from your screen, you'll be able to see the chat. Uh, if you can post any questions you might have throughout the webinar, um, as chairs, we'll be collating these and asking them to our speakers at the end. Um, but please feel free to post the questions any time. Um, we can then collate them all together. Uh, we'll go into it in further detail at the, uh, after all of the speakers' presentations. But we will also have the opportunity to um, have an open verbal uh, discussion um, with all of our uh, people that are interested in asking a verbal question at the end, and we'll explain how to do that. Um, so I think that's it for housekeeping. I might hand over to uh, Dr. John Bellatier at UCSD, who will walk us through today's presentations and topics. Thank you, Tepi, and thank you, everybody, for coming uh, here at UCSD and internationally. Um, this research symposium is about research output dissemination, which is a very simple concept. Researchers work hard on creating new knowledge, and that knowledge gets disseminated to their networks. If there's a desire to get that information out to a broader network, say the public, dissemination is important. Some keys to research dissemination is to know what are the dissemination channels that are available, how you can interact with those dissemination channels. And what you'll learn today is that there's some steps that can be taken, strategized to better interact with those dissemination channels to maximize your research output dissemination. So the number one message that you'll probably hear is that you need to plan ahead. And I know Heather is going to wrap things up here and, and really hammer that home. That's what I picked up from talking to all four of our excellent speakers. All of the speakers are from three different continents. Um, the two speakers that are here today live in UCSD, one is from San Diego and the other one flew in just a couple of hours ago from the East Coast. So we're very thankful to our speakers and also to Matthew Tepe for organizing this event, as well as Alan for um, Alan Larson here at UCSD for really putting together a lot, of, uh, a lot of the organization. So without further ado, I just want to introduce the four speakers that we're going to have briefly. Uh, the first one is 
Ewan Addy, who is in London at the moment, and it's 10 p.m., so we're especially thankful to Ewan for staying awake and talking to us. Um, Ewan's thirst for scientific knowledge and his um, bioinformatics skills back in 2011 led him to discover a method for measuring research output dissemination. And he later went on to found a company called Altmetric, which is one of the leading uh, providers of Altmetrics. Ewan's company's mission is to track and analyze online scholarly activity around the world. So Ewan is going to open it up by telling us how we can measure our research output dissemination. Then we have Bruce Wilson, who's a triathlete from the East Coast and has spent his career in higher education and uh, non-profit non, uh, non publishing. Uh, Bruce is the co-CEO of The Conversation, which is one of these media, uh, one of these dissemination channels that you'll, you'll learn about today that I personally think is one of, the, one of the best methods for communicating our information that is generated by researchers to a wide audience. And Bruce is gonna talk about how wide that audience is. And he's also gonna tell us a little bit about how to interact with the company to better, uh, to maximize the ability for us to, to um, disseminate our research. Then we have Michael Wheeler, who is a researcher himself finishing his PhD in the study of sedentary behavior and cognitive outcomes. Um, Michael also spent some time working at The Naked Scientist, which is a world leading science blogger and podcast network. And Michael's gonna tell us a little bit about the inside story of what goes on at these, um, at, at these science communication hubs and how we can better interact with them. Finally, we have Heather Bushman, who is a fellow researcher turned into a science writer. And now Heather is the public information officer here at UC San Diego. And so what Heather does is she provides consultation on research output and methods for the best dissemination for each individual piece of research communication, sort of like a hub for research output dissemination. And perfectly suited as Heather was both a researcher and a science communicator, making her uh, very well qualified to be able to give us this type of information. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Ewan, who's going to start talking to us about uh, Altmetric. Thanks, John. Uh, let's share this. <coughs> ah, yeah, so as John said, my name is Ewan Addy, um, and I'm from a company called Altmetric. Uh, I wasn't always kind of doing this kind of thing. I started out as a scientist and then I worked for a bit uh, for a publishing company, for an academic publishing company. And what I was going to do in this talk is first uh, lay a little bit of the groundwork for why this stuff is important. I mean, it's always been important dissemination of your work as a researcher, but why it's even more important nowadays. And then also talk a little bit about all metrics, which is really, you know, to, to give you the spoiler up front. Um, one of the kind of new methods for measuring and, and getting a feel for uh, this kind of activity. So like I said, I'll, I'll lay the groundwork first, and that's really this. Like as probably everyone knows, traditionally we've been very good at recognizing and showing citations from these kind of things, so academic journals. Um, and, you know, if you think about what we're measuring there, you know, we're thinking, we're talking about our peers, one researcher using the work of another researcher. It doesn't necessarily say that it's good quality research or that they were building on it or anything like that. They could be citing it for any number of reasons, but it's used as a kind of a proxy, if you like, uh, for how good that other person's research is, for, for better or worse. What traditionally we've not been very good at um, in indexes like you know, Web of Science or Scopus or Google Scholar or however else you like to get your citations is used in other places. So documents like these, for example, these are policy documents and guidelines. Uh, if you think about the World Health Organization's guidelines for treating different diseases or reports uh, designed for government from the Food and Agricultural Organization uh, for health services worldwide, this kind of thing. These are also 
you know, research-based publications, right? They also have a bibliography at the back and it's based on academic research, but you don't necessarily get the credit when you get cited here that you would uh, if you get cited in a journal. And it's even worse if you move outside of kind of the grey literature and you think about things like Twitter or other social media outlets. Um, so if you think about your work being, this is, these are very medical examples, I apologise for that, it's because that's kind of the area I come from, but if you think about patient groups, uh, charities involved with diseases, this kind of thing, who are interested, obviously they have a vested interest in the research you might be doing, it's a good thing for your work to reach them, right? It's, it's useful for them directly, but you wouldn't necessarily get credit for it through citations, right? These are not indexed uh, in the same way as the journal citations. I mean, those were quite local examples, but you can think of an extreme one uh, to illustrate this point, which would be something like this. So this paper uh, published in Environmental Research Letter has been treated by Greenpeace to prove a point, and then it's been picked up by Barack Obama. So that, that's an impact, right? Like you would think that that means something to you as a researcher. It's viable in some way. It's evidence of nothing else that what you're publishing is you know, reaching people who can potentially change things. And I think it's important because nowadays research is assessed on multiple levels. So hopefully we all agree that quality is, has to be the, the bedrock of it and everyone's striving to do good research. If you're not, then you know, that's a problem not for this webinar. Um, but there's also this concept of impact. And really that's being driven by governments and, and funders worldwide. Sadly, uh, mostly on the basis of you know, having to allocate costs uh, which is kind of fair enough. If you think about it, you know, you've got less money to spend on research. We've already said that the research we fund has to be good quality. What kind of other factors can be uh, brought in now? So one of this is this, this new idea of broader impacts, so that the work is not only going to be really good, but it's also going to somehow change society for the better, change the way, that's quite a, a high bar, but, uh, you know, change the way people do things for the better. So if now we're looking for quality and this new impact, you know, how do we get from one to the other? Um, and then you know, the overly simple answer is that you need the right people to see your work, right? The people in uh, public policy or the people in practice, because it's not necessarily about policy, it's also about people, you know, if you think about an ER nurse or an engineer or anyone who's consuming research and then doing something with it in real life. Um, on the kind of more humanities and social sciences side, it's more about the impact you can think about as things like changing the way people think about a problem or they approach different problems. Um, and they're, you know, those consumers, how are they going to see your work? Somehow you have to get it to them. And there is this kind of idea amongst a lot of researchers that, that we've spoken to, and certainly this was my idea when I was in research, which is that once you've done the work, you know, that's it. My work here is done. I've produced the research. I now need to move on to something else. And it's somebody else's job to kind of take it and get it to the people who need it. And unfortunately, that's just not true. Uh, I'm not sure it was ever really, really true, but it's definitely not true now. Um, if you publish in a quite a, you know, a high impact factor journal, by which I mean one that has like a lot of editorial staff and a press office, then you might get support from the journal. Um, and they might take and do something with it. But a lot of the time it's down to you as a researcher. You're the person responsible, unfortunately, for taking work and kind of giving it a bit of a boost to try and get it in front of people. So in terms of what's our metrics, so if we accept that research gets viewed and used in lots of different contexts, so obviously citations, but then the policy, on social media, uh, you know, present at conferences, any other uh, number of different ways. Our metrics is, a complement to traditional metrics, academic metrics, and that it tries to track that usage. And it tries to inform how much and what kind of attention is being received by a, a research article or a book or a data set or, or what have you. There's a few kind of misleading things about the name. So one is alt, which implies that it's an alternative to citations. It's, it's not at all, it's just one extra factor. Um, the other one is having metrics in the name implies that the field is actually very quantitative. It's all about numbers and indicators and measures. Um, but as we'll see in a minute, that's 
that's also a bit misleading. It can be a bit dangerous. Axial metrics is a combination that can be both qualitative and quantitative. So it's important um, not just to look at how much attention something's getting, but also what kind of attention it is and who it is that's saying it. And of course, like I said, it complements citation counts and peer review. It's definitely not a replacement. It's not a number you can kind of drop in um, for like a silver bullet that will uh, solve a lot of problems. In practice, there's a few different ways you can access uh, Altmetrics. Because I'm from Altmetric, confusingly, the, the company, um, this is how we present it. And this is how you'll quite often see it on a, a journal homepage, for example, or a journal article page. So we have this kind of visualization and then a number in the middle. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about how this number is created, but basically we have a weighted score and we you know, say, how many times is something mentioned in the news? How many times is it mentioned on Twitter? Is it mentioned on blogs, Wikipedia, all this different kind of thing. And um, that changes the kind of colors of the visualization and it creates a score, which we call the attention score. And it really is um, the attention score. So if I go back to here and we say, okay, let's think of these different things that a paper can have, you know, quality, that's where the peer review part needs to come in. There's not really any way of measuring quality of the paper. Uh, attention, that's what this metric score is measuring. And then impact, that's where the more, the kind of the qualitative aspect of it. So the number is there for attention because you can say how much attention something has. For impact, it's a bit more nuanced. So I'll come back to some of those points in a second, but um, to get kind of straight into it, how do you boost attention? If we say, okay, well, we want attention because we want it to get it to the right people so we can have some actual impact. How do I get the most attention? And unfortunately, there's not a great kind of shortcut to this. It involves work. The key thing is to do that quality, good, interesting work. That's always going to help. Um, some things is, you know, you're going to have a harder time pushing than others. That's completely fine. It's, you know, the attention is not the be all and then all of everything. Um, our suggestion is always to take advantage of the help available. Um, and I think we're going to hear about this later, but take advantage of the press office, the comms office in your department, in your institution, they want to help you. Um, if the journal does have, you know, the ability to help you, you know, ask the editor, ask the, the press office there. It's important to think about your goals and target a relevant audience. So again, I said that, you know, the amount of attention isn't necessarily the most important thing. And that's because if you think about it, um, depending on what kind of impact you want, you'll want to reach different people. Uh, the funny thing is with research, a lot of the time, different stakeholders come with different things. So maybe your university is interested in anything that can become a patent or be interested to commercial groups that can be commercialized. Maybe you're interested in reaching your peers um, for, you know, more for um, uh, developing the field. Uh, or your career for that matter. And maybe your funder is interested in public engagement, is interested in reaching like, you know, a large public audience. So depending on which one of them is the most important at the time, you know, the amount of attention you get uh, may vary. Um, I won't throw too much stuff in here because I think there's some excellent ideas coming up. Just look at the speakers list. Uh, that covers some of the bases already I would have talked about. Just on a technical note, though, I would end with this, which is when discussing your work, and that, I mean, on social media, on, on a blog, uh, if you're involved in preparing a press release, then the most important thing from a, just a tracking perspective is to link to it. So ideally with a, a DOI link, you'll get them at the top of the article when it gets published by uh, an academic publisher in the journal, you'll have the DOI number. And it's normally made into a link at the xdi.org link. If you can use that, that's the best. But otherwise, just link to the, the journal article page itself. Don't just say a new paper in cell by, you know, Alice Smith. So I said already, don't fixate on the numbers. Um, and I mentioned, you know, partly the reason is because of this subjective idea of what's important. Um, context really does matter. So you can get attention that's positive and you can get attention that's negative. And here's a good example of that. Um, I don't know if you remember this. Uh, this is September the 19th last year, uh, where there was a basically an article published, not to go into a lot of detail, but 
a quite controversial article published in Third World Quarterly. I think it was kind of a defensive colonialism. And a lot of scientists, a lot of researchers on, on Twitter were very angry about it. Um, and then what was interesting to us was to see people twig that the more they tweeted about the article, the higher the attention was. Therefore, the higher the Almetric attention score. And because everyone assumed that a higher attention score was better, they said things like this. Oh, we should stop tweeting, actually, because it's just, you know, adding to this guy's score, um, which implies that it's a good thing for him. But of course, if you go and look at the details, if you click on any of those kind of donor visualizations and you see the actual tweets behind it, it's people saying, you know, this is a terrible paper, how did it get published? Um, you know, they should never have got past peer review or the editor should never have let it uh, get past them, that kind of thing. So the context really is important. Um, the other thing about the numbers is, you know, sometimes, and uh, you know, you get this with conferences as well, sometimes talking, if you think about it, as a kind of comparison or uh, um, to think about it in that term, sometimes talking to the right 10 people is much more important, much more useful than talking to the kind of wrong 1000 people, right? Um, it only takes, you know, that one person who's going to take your work and do something interesting with it or create a new collaboration or, um, you know, build on it in some way for them to find out about it. And the trouble is, you know, how do you identify them? So don't focus too much on numbers and on kind of getting the biggest, broadest audience possible. That's maybe not the best solution. I'm, I'm sure other speakers will talk about this more. Okay, I'm going to wrap up there. It was kind of a whistle stop tour, but uh, thanks very much for listening. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Ewan. That was a fantastic talk. And I think really good one to start off with. Um, I'm just going to share my screen quickly. <clears throat> so, an introduction to altmetrics to start us off. But now we're uh, getting into um, some of the content around dissemination and what we can do. Um, so it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Bruce Wilson. Uh, Bruce started his career at the Chronicle of Higher Education. Uh, the leading print and digital publication for the academic community, as it was. Uh, Bruce has had 25 years working in the higher education and not-for-profit industry. Bruce left um, NBC News uh, to become the linchpin for launching the Conversation US, and he brought on board in 20, uh, he was brought on board in September of 2014 as the executive director, and he is now the co-CEO of the Conversation US. Um, he has been leading efforts to build up the Conversation's presence in ac academic, not-for-profit, and media communities here in the US. Since then, he's built the university membership model, which now includes 60 universities, and leads all efforts to increase the support of numerous blue chip foundations to more than 12. Um, and he's also been responsible for creating and running partnerships with the Associated Press, PBS, and the Aspen Institute. So it's my delight to uh, swap back over to uh, America and launch with Bruce. Thank you. Great. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. It's interesting to be following up uh, altmetrics. And matter of fact, you and I would like to speak to you at some point um, about how we might um, collaborate a little bit more together. So um, I'm very pleased to be here sharing what's going to be very difficult for me to do in 10 minutes. Uh, and I need to make sure I get a hand, a, a finger up when there's a minute left here. I will do my best. So um, for those who do not know who the conversation is, uh, I could have had a lot more slides in here, but even before I get into this slide, it's important to note that the conversation was launched in Australia in 2011 at the University of Melbourne, and the group of eight um, largest research universities in Australia um, joined forces together uh, to help launch the conversation. Uh, it was so successful it is now one of the leading destination news sites in all of Australia, averaging over 3 million readers monthly. It moved on to the UK in 2013 and now has 82 
universities in the UK supporting the conversation. And when I learned about the conversation, I was at NBC News at 30 Rockefeller Plaza and uh, immediately contacted the founder, uh, Andrew Jaspin in Australia to say, if you're planning on launching in the US, I would like to be part of that. Um, but at this stage of the game, the conversation is now in last month, in, a, in the month of August, had 36 million readers worldwide. And we are now in uh, France, we are in South Africa, Northern Africa, um, we just launched in Spain, Canada, Indonesia. So the conversation has really struck a nerve with figuring out a way now that the news news industry is really struggling to have experts write uh, to the public. So we are now filling a void, which we think um, has gotten bigger than ever. So um, our whole reason for existing, um, it's a new model that brings together academics and journalists. And it's important to note that um, each one of our journalists, and we have just editors in the US, we have 18 of them. Uh, and each one of them is a former beat writer at a news organization or at a magazine. So our editor of the business and economics section uh, used to be at Bloomberg News and at the Wall Street Journal. Our head of health and medicine used to be the health and medicine editor at the Atlanta Constitution. We have people that have been at um, numerous other media outlets. And so when an academic gets um, merged with that, when they collaborate with an editor, they know what they're talking about. We don't have, um, uh, generalist working with somebody who gets very involved in especially in the health and medicine area and science area. You need to have people that know what their author is talking about. So we, the whole goal of this is for the public good. So all academics, obviously research is critically important uh, and tenure is incredibly important and their jobs are to, to do research and to teach students. What we do though is we leverage all of the um, intensive work and research that's been done to share with the public. Because to be perfectly honest with you, the public needs the university academics far more than the university academics need the conversation. But if not the experts that are sitting on college campuses, actually who really are studying the important things that are going on, in some cases, curious things, there are no more experts left except for in very few news organizations, which is why this is all about the public and the public needs trusted information. So <clears throat> we are not for profit, 100% not for profit. You will notice, and I know even here at UC San Diego, a number of our original foundation supporters also fund research here on campus. Um, and so some of these names, and we are very fortunate in the U.S., which is not true in the other countries, we have these big foundations that fund incredible amount of research on college campuses. Matter of fact, without these private foundations, a lot of great work would never happen. Um, but the reason they fund us is because the research that they fund in academe, they want it to be shared with the public. And that is what why these other ones, and you may notice, recognize some of these names, Carnegie, Ford, Simon Foundation, the Henry Luce Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, um, all of these foundations are the backbone of why we exist. So they fund over 50% of all of our, um, our, our budget, and the other 50% comes from universities, and the other countries, most of the research, most of the funding to support the conversation is all from the universities. So we think uh, data is really, really, really important. And we have a incredible CMS system. And these are not fake numbers. We can actually watch a story go viral and see it go from 52 readers within the first 10 minutes of the, a, a story being launched um, to 55,000 readers sometimes in a day. And it's incredible to be able to watch that. And the reason for all of these numbers, uh, in the last year, 91 million just here in the US alone. Um, and we only did 608 articles in the last 90 days, but they average almost 24 million readers um, uh, during that time. And each article averages close to 40,000 readers per article. So if you ask an academic, when the last time is that they had even 10,000 people read something that they wrote. Not very many of them, except for op-ed pieces, have seen that. Doesn't mean that's the most critical thing, 
but it is getting access to people that typically they may not ever have read anything from them. And the average article gets over 21 republishers per article. So that is the beauty of the conversation is that when you write for us, you get readers on our site, but then it ends up in places, and I will share that in a second, but like the Washington Post, Scientific American, Smithsonian, The Guardian, um, Salon, and also lots and lots of local newspapers. I mean, when you come to think, talk about things like the opioid uh, crisis, um, geriatrics, dementia, and Alzheimer's, little local newspapers no longer have experts that ever can write for them. The only people they have that can write are consultants, parents. We actually bring a researcher from UC San Diego or Johns Hopkins right to a local small newspaper. Really, really, really important. So um, to get into this whole idea of why write for the conversation from the academics perspective, we did a survey very recently, this is very new data, where over 700 authors of the conversation answered this survey, so this is not a small sample size. And as you can see, 43% were approached by other academic, for other academic collaboration, 31% increased citations of scholarly articles. Um, they use the articles or metrics as part of grant funding. They influence policymakers. 41, 51% were asked to speak on radio interviews, print outlets, write other articles, request for TV interviews, and 7% book proposals. So we have nothing to do with this. This is not something that we go out and we pitch. And the interesting thing about altmetrics is we've started seeing more and more frequently academics sharing with each other that their altmetric scores have gone up significantly every time they write for the conversation. So if you can all see this, every author gets a dashboard. And this is what the universities and the academics themselves love. So if you look at this dashboard, this person's written three articles. And between them, they've had 591,000 readers. And if you go down, um, if I can scroll down, I mean, if you look to the right-hand side, you can see Washington Post, Newsweek, PBS NewsHour, Salon, Science Alert. So, and that's just the beginning, but you can see those numbers. So the influence and it, of these um, reaches different audiences. And the great thing about the conversation is the average article gets over, uh, has 12 different links. All of the articles are significantly fact-checked. Three editors touch every article. And in the end though, the academic has the final say of an of a article until the academic says it is good to go it doesn't run so if they don't like the title if they don't like a photo a subheading the academic actually finally has the word and anyone that's written and been interviewed they get no word on what gets published the next day here it's 100 percent control and the great thing is that each of these articles on average gets um has 12 links to secondary research for papers books um, other articles have been written, so we, and, and when that gets picked up by another publication, they have to take the entire story, can't edit it, has to take every single link, and those links have to be live, and at the end of every article in the beginning, or at the beginning, it has to give reference to who the academic is, their university affiliation, and what their title is. So it is an incredible way to bring attention, which is where we're finding um, a lot of the metrics being driven because you've got thought leaders that are reading any of these other publications, including like the World Economic Forum. Um, and I'll get to that list in a second. So it's important to note that these also these articles, the same story can end up in Fox News and on the San Francisco Chronicle on the Daily Caller, which is Tucker Carlson from Fox News is 50 million conservative readers monthly, the same story can end up on CNN. So how often do you ever see a piece that where it's picked up in the right and the left and the same article with no edits to it? Here's a few um, uh, quotes here that you can read, but again, this is the altmetrics thing that these, this is all communication between these authors, it has nothing to do with us that they shared with us. So it is a great way to be able to see impact even at federal agencies who saw and read articles and these couple of last minute things but here are two on the left side that were were 
conversation articles were used on the Senate floor and on the, 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 uh, and the um, House representatives floor. And it is wonderful when we start seeing the content that's written by academics actually influence policy. And this, the last slide will be, this will give you an idea just in the last two years, how many, who's picked us up. So you can see these, I don't have to read them, but all of these are mainstream media who are coming to the conversation more frequently now because they know what they're getting is trusted information. So I think I've ended in 10 minutes, correct? Uh, thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you, Bruce. Fantastic talk. Um, and some real insights into how dissemination might lead to more dissemination there with the 50% uh, of those that published getting asked to uh, write, asked to be on a radio interview. That's really quite interesting. Um, I won't dwell too much though, because we've got plenty to get through. And we'll, just as a reminder, we'll have that opportunity at the end to pose questions. Um, there hasn't been many questions in the chat box so far, and I know that everyone will have uh, some burning questions, so get them in there. Our chairs are busily going to uh, collate them together for the end, and it'll be really good to have some uh, high-quality questions for the end, so get posting. Um, so our next speaker is um, Michael Wheeler. Uh, Michael will discuss his internship experience with the science podcast the Naked Scientists, so he's not going to get naked for us, hopefully, um, based in the Cambridge, UK, the, the Naked Scientists is. Michael will share some of his operational insight into the industry of science communication and how it works in conjunction with the world of scientific research. His talk will focus on the importance of disseminating the message uh, of a piece of research. So Michael studies his undergraduate exercise science at Dublin City University in Ireland. He's currently completing his PhD in the topic of sedentary behaviour and brain health, which is a collaboration between the University of Western Australia and the Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute in Melbourne. So without any further ado, go for it, Michael. Thanks, Tabby. So thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm currently a final year PhD student, but about 10 months ago, I was working as a science journalist on internship with a group called the Naked Scientists based in Cambridge in the UK. So today I'd like to share some of the things I learned from that three month experience, uh, really relating to the overlap between science communication and scientific research. So just to give a quick overview of what I'm going to speak about, um, I'd like to give a, an operational insight into how the world of science communication and the world of scientific research work in tandem. Um, I also want to share an example of some work I did while in Cambridge and finally leave you with some take home messages on how to get involved in science communication as a researcher. So the Naked Scientists are a uh, science radio show that produce radio programs and articles. They're broadcast uh, over the BBC in the UK and the ABC in Australia and content is also published online. Uh, and they have a weekly reach of approximately one million people. Um, so essentially when it comes to making science radio programs, there, there are two main jobs really. Uh, the first one, which is what I'm demonstrating here, is uh, presenting, which is essentially doing the talking. Um, but that really only takes up a fraction of the time compared to producing, which is everything else from finding scientists to talk to, uh, to editing audio from interviews, um, and even writing a script for yourself or someone else to present. Um, and what we worked towards at The Naked Scientist was um, essentially to create a uh, one hour radio show every week. And that radio show was split up into two halves. So we had um, the first half being a coverage of the science news, and the second half or back half being a more in-depth look at a given topic that, that was not necessarily timely. Um, so on Monday morning, we'd come in and we'd check the, the science news to see what was um, being published. 
And what we would do is we'd try and make initial contact with authors uh, to see if we can organize an initial research call, which was an unrecorded chat. Um, so that was our first contact, and we, we used that essentially to assess the potential of the story. But we would also assess the potential of the speaker to see if they were able to explain their story um, well. Uh, and finally, uh, if, if we were happy and we wanted to run with the story, we would try and book a radio studio uh, for a recorded interview. Um, so what we used there was um, we, we recorded our interviews over what's called an ISDN line, which is essentially a special phone line uh, found in recording studios that allows us to speak to anyone from around the world um, and record the conversation with the same quality as if they were sitting beside you in a studio. So as a researcher, it's good to familiarize yourself as to whether your university or research institute has an ISDN line, um, as you may be asked to give an interview over ISDN. Um, and the good thing about um, recorded interviews uh, is that um, it, it can be edited down. Um, so we used to record about 15 to 20 minutes of conversation, but we would edit it down into a four minute audio clip. So you don't have to be nervous if you're doing a recorded interview, you can always um, repeat something if you haven't explained it well. Um, and I think that's, uh, um, that's something to um, kind of relax you a little bit more about dealing with the media. Um, also with the news stories, we would write them up as articles for publication on the website. Um, so I just want to give an example of some work I did in Cambridge. Um, and just quickly, it was, you know, a, a really great intellectual freedom to talk about uh, a lot of different topics. So I worked on uh, everything from exercise to climate change to cancer research uh, and marine biology. But there's just one example that I'd like to, to share with you. Um, and this is a new story I covered while I was with the Naked Scientists. And it's a publication about climate change. Essentially, the background is that during the Paris Agreement, it was decided that we cannot surpass two degrees of global warming above pre-industrial temperatures without catastrophic consequences for the environment. But we, we should really try and limit warming to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial. And since CO2 emissions are one of the main drivers of this warming, scientists estimate how much warming will result from a given amount of emitted carbon, um, also known as the carbon budget. So at the time of the Paris Agreement, um, the estimates were that we had about four years of current carbon emissions before we surpassed 1.5 degrees, um, which was essentially a, a geophysical impossibility. Um, now, this paper made uh, a big impact because it was a new best estimate uh, for how much carbon we could emit, and uh, it, it gave us 20 years of current emissions before we surpassed 1.5 degrees. Now, you can imagine with this type of research, the, the message that um, gets out there to the public is going to have huge consequences. Um, and I had a chance to speak to, the, uh, to one of the authors and to ask them about that particular issue. So I'm just going to play a uh, uh, a short recording of that conversation I had with the, the author. So hopefully this works. So your analysis has given us a larger carbon budget and some more hope. And I think there's two ways that that message can be taken up. I mean, on one hand, if people believe that we've gone past a point of no return, then they also believe that any efforts towards conservation will be meaningless. So your analysis steps us back from that, which I think is a good thing. But on the other hand, it may have the potential to relax people a bit more about climate change. So uh, I'm not sure which one of those will be most prevalent. Um, what do you think? Our research really put the possibility of limiting warming to 1.5 degree back on the table. And I think that's a hopeful message. But that doesn't really mean that the pressure is off. It still requires actions way beyond the pledges that are currently on the table by countries and global carbon dioxide emissions need to be reduced 
immediately to become zero by mid-century. And that's an incredibly challenging feat. Okay, so you heard the author there basically saying that um, this is really putting the, uh, the possibility of limiting, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees back on the table. Um, you know, unfortunately, not every news media outlet uh, picked up on this message. And uh, here's some examples of some papers that um, reported on the story. Um, and essentially, they, they kind of misrepresented what the, what the authors were saying. So, you know, this is just an example of, of how it's, you know, really important to kind of get a hold of the message of your research if you're publishing. Um, and, you know, and you can do this by helping write the press release um, so that, you know, the message uh, is, you know, crystal clear as it goes out to the public. So finally, I just want to leave you with some take home lessons um, that I've learned and how to get involved in science communication as a researcher. Um, so first take home message that, uh, you know, if you're an expert, uh, share your knowledge with a wider audience. You know, there's fewer journalists now working with even fewer resources and people are getting their information on platforms which may not be credible. So as an expert, you're really in a unique position to be a bright spot in, you know, an otherwise um, hazy slurry of misleading or misrepresented information. So um, I think you should take advantage of that uh, unique position. Um, you know, by writing for uh, uh, websites like The Conversation or even The Naked Scientists. Um, the message of a, re uh, a piece of research is uh, so important. Um, and you can take control of this uh, message uh, when publishing something newsworthy by helping write a press release, for example. Um, and finally, I think it's, it's always good to get into conversations with people about research. Uh, and this is a, a really big one because it's the most common way researchers engage in science communication. You know, every week as a researcher, you're asked, uh, you know, about what you do at a barbecue or a birthday party. Um, you know, and this is an opportunity to try different ways of explaining what you do. Um, but it's not all about um, explaining. It's about, um, you know, active listening um, to be able to uh, see how uh, other people perceive um, what you're talking about, but to also... Uh, you know, absorb their perspective and their gained knowledge. Um, so just some, you know, some ways to, to get involved in science communication. Um, it's great uh, if you're an expert and you can uh, write articles about your area of expertise for the likes of the conversation um, or the naked scientists. Um, the email address, if you are submitting to the Naked Scientist, is uh, for, uh, an article for consideration is um, is there, and they have a, um, a section on the the website for the conversation for submitting pitches as well. Um, I also highly recommend getting involved in science communication competitions. Now, I've just given a, a list of a, a few here, uh, like the Three Minute Thesis or Fame Lab, uh, and Pint of science, but there's literally um, there's literally I don't know dozens uh, of different uh, types of science communication competitions all around the world, and um, you know they're they're really great fun, and it's uh, you know it's great practice as well, and some of them um, can often have you know quite good uh, prizes as well, um, and you know finally. Uh, help write your own press releases when publishing. Um, you know, I think this is really important um, to kind of get a handle on the message. Um, but also, if you're publishing something newsworthy, uh, it's a really good idea to set aside time for media duties. You know, often when we were contacting researchers um, who had a really interesting piece out in, in that they were publishing, uh, often they were too busy to actually do an interview, which is a real shame because um, you know, it really does, uh, you know, help everyone. It helps them and it um, boosts their research and, you know, it helps people understand, um, you know, an important issue better. So set aside time. When, if you know a publication is coming out, set aside time for media duties, um, you know, and you can even 
be proactive about this and um, um, try and uh, get your research out there in front of people. Um, you know, even by, if you're not um, writing for the conversation or something like that, you can even, if, if, if you know uh, any journalists working for uh, papers, you can uh, try and, you know, make contact with them there. They're always more than happy to hear um, about what you're working on. And I think there's a real push towards um, service journalism now, you know, which is essentially news that you can use. Um, uh, so if your research is of practical, um, has practical implications, um, you know, that likely means that it's going to be uh, highly newsworthy. So, um, so that's it. I, I think we probably have some time for questions at the end. So I look forward to, uh, to answering some of those. Um, so thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Michael. Um, and I'm sure that, yeah, there will be many questions at the end. Um, we've already had a few started coming through, which is fantastic. Um, you can, if you're a bit shy and you're not wanting to post it in a public group, um, which may be the case, uh, you can send it to just us as what Zoom terms panelists. Um, panelists you can send through and we'll be able to see your question. Um, if you want it to be anonymous, that's absolutely fine. Just, just make that clear. Um, so our next speaker, our final speaker for today is Dr. Heather Bushman. Um, Heather has 12 years of experience communicating science to non-scientists. She earned her PhD in molecular pathology at UC San Diego and completed a health communications internship at the National Cancer Institute's press office. She spent her first years away from the research bench as a science writer and communications manager at the Scripps Research Institute. We're really fortunate to have her because she's currently the senior, senior communications and media relations manager for UC San Diego Health, where she translates complex research findings into lay-friendly stories in the form of press releases, newspaper articles, magazine pieces, videos, podcast episodes, and more. So we may well hear about some other modes. Over to you, John Heather. All right, thank you. I am, okay. I'm in the box labeled Alan Larson back here at UC San Diego. Um, like was said, I used to be a scientist. I'm now a professional science communicator and writer. Um, so I'm very passionate about this topic and particularly about increasing the public's understanding of science. So it's perfect that I come last in this panel because we've talked a lot about what you can do as an individual researcher to reach the general public, um, which are all things I encourage you to do. But now I'm gonna tell you about how, how and why you should get to know your PIO. And that is me, a public information officer. Um, and that is so that we can help amplify everything you're doing through all of our channels. So I'm of course going to focus on um, some examples of what we do here at UC San Diego Health. Um, and I, so I cover um, with my team, we have a team of uh, seven in our communications department that covers uh, our whole health system. So that's our whole clinical wow. enterprise. So hospitals, clinics, then um, our two professional schools, the School of Medicine and the School of Pharmacy, and all the research that goes on there. Um, but I want you to know that no matter what institution or university you're at, I promise you, you also have a public information officer. It can be a little confusing because our departments go by a lot of different names. So you might have a communications office, media relations, um, public information, public affairs, public relations. We pretty much all do the same thing, and that's two main buckets that I like to think of, um, one being our owned media. And so that's me writing, podcasting, producing video for all of the various channels that we own as an institution. And then the other bucket is earned media. And this is the work I do in media relations to help connect you and your expertise to um, outside media outlets. And so a little bit about what that looks like. So here, um, like most institutions, we have a newsroom page. So this is health.ucsd.edu slash news. And this is where you can find most of our owned media channels. Um, so that's press releases. We have news features. Um, there's a feed here from our YouTube page for videos, a feed from our Tumblr blog, um, all kinds of things. You can find my podcast from here. Um, we also contribute to even more owned media channels on the main academic campus. 
And one of those first things I mentioned was a press release, and that has also been mentioned in a couple of the previous uh, presentations. And so I want to take a minute to give a little definition to that, because I think that's a term that gets thrown around a bit and not always necessarily understood what it is. So it's a very specific thing, right? It is intended for members of the lay media, and it is our chance, um, your communications office, your public information officer, to provide a short lay-friendly summary to members of the media, to reporters, journalists, news outlets, and hopefully pique their interest in that piece of news, in that research, in you, so that they will request interviews and write, do their own reporting. Um, of course, as we know, as newsrooms shrink, um, uh, uh, media uh, um, in-house staff, um, outlets rely more and more on us and rely on press releases more and more. So there's more and more pressure put on them. Um, I will say that press releases do get a bad rap for sucking um, and not being honest or accurate, um, hyping things. I will say that they don't have to. We do a lot um, in our team to make sure that press releases are accurate while still being interesting, hopefully. <clears throat> uh, so what, what it looks like is, of course, what most people see and just think it is, is, oh, you've written an article and you put it on your institution's web, uh, website, right? So here's an example of one of my favorite press releases we did last year. Um, and that's true. It is an article on our websites. We do share it through... Uh, um, other owned communication channels like our social media. But the big difference here between this and any other sort of just web article is all the behind the scenes work that goes into distributing that to um, local, national, international media outlets. Uh, so here's an example of earned media. So press releases being kind of that bridge between our owned media and then it's the currency that we use um, most, it's not the only one, but it's a, a, a mechanism we use to reach out to and attract earned media. And so you see this kind of stuff every day. This is just a snapshot of just a few months time, just our people from our SCAG School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences and some of the um, mainstream media outlets that they, they appeared in. So what makes news? So um, I, I'm sorry to say that not everything that is important in um, a particular scientific field is going to be of interest to the lay public. Um, so we do um, put a high value on the things that will interest the general public. And those can be research papers. That is um, kind of the bread and butter of what I do is learning about new research papers that are coming out um, and writing press releases or other communications about them. Um, and Research papers, I think, make it easy to be news because they're inherently newsy in that there, there's a, a timeliness to it. There's a news hook. It's, come, it's new and it's coming out today. Okay, but there's lots of other interesting stories we can tell about the people who do work. And then there's also um, what, what is sometimes called news jacking, which we like to do, which is taking advantage of current events. Um, and things going on in the national news where we might have local experts who can comment on that, right? So here's some examples here. Remember the dress on social media or more recently the Laurel versus Yanny. Um, so when something like that kind of goes viral nationally, news outlets everywhere scramble to find an expert who can talk to them about that and explain the science behind that, right? Um, or the other example here is um, the movie Concussion starring Will Smith, right? So that was coming out and then suddenly um, our concussion experts are in high demand to talk about that particular issue. Um, more recent example is last week, Apple announced the new Apple Watch would measure heart rates at home, could, diagnose, could basically perform an ECG at home and diagnose atrial fibrillation. Um, so suddenly everybody um, wants to know um, from AFib experts, from cardiologists, what this means, what is, is it important, um, what are the, are they excited, what are the challenges going to be, so um, lots of things can be news. Um, but I also want to take a moment to mention some things that do not make news, and, and I am specifically referring to in the general, to the general public in mainstream media, right? There are places in trade publications for some of this stuff, but we do not typically write press releases on um, incremental research findings, review articles, most method papers. Um, you know, these are things that are important to the scientific community and to your peers, but are not going to really mean much to the average person on the street. So, um, but the main thing that I, that, so in the rest of my presentation, 
what's in green, um, I consider the really important take home messages. So um, one thing we struggle with a lot is that papers that have already published online more than a couple days ago is old news. So it's kind of a struggle. It's a different culture between news media and scientists because scientists to a scientist, things move a little more slowly. Um, research takes a long time, I know that. Uh, so something that's published maybe six months ago, still considered new in your field, but that's even something a couple, published a couple days ago is old news to a reporter. So um, I just pulled this up while I was making these slides um, to show you this is an interesting paper. You know, maybe I'd be doing something on that, but if you sent that to me today, I would look at how that was already published um, not that long ago to you, but, you know, old news to a reporter. So this brings to me to how you, researchers, can help us help you. Make sure we're aware of your specialties. So at least just touch base, make sure we know who you are and some of the kind of hot topics that you're working on or might be interested in um, speaking to media about. We might not have something, some immediate need for that or way to highlight you, but it's always nice to have more people, more experts willing to talk to media in our back pockets. Make yourself available, I think someone else said this too, make yourself available for interviews on short notice. So again, media, timelines are short and fast. So especially local TV news, they have their morning meetings at probably 9 a.m. That's where things, stories get assigned for the day. They have between maybe 10 a.m. when they get out and 2 p.m. to go out around San Diego, film their interviews, any B-roll, and get that packaged up between 2 and 4 so it can make it on to the evening news. So that means we're scrambling when we get a call at 10 a.m. Do you have an expert on whatever topic? On concussions, on AFib? then we're scrambling to find that expert and really hoping that they will answer our calls and emails and texts and make themselves available. Um, keep us in the loop when you're contacted by media. So um, I should say we're not, our office is here to help you. We're not gatekeepers, right? So we're connectors. So you may be uh, contacted directly by media. A lot of times they'll come to us because they don't know who they need. They just need an expert on a particular topic. And then we know those people and go and find them. Um, but sometimes they will find you, especially if you've written in the conversation or, you know, you've put yourself out there in other ways and are starting to become a subject matter expert. Um, if you have your own website, if you're tweeting, um, and that's great, but please do keep us in the loop so we can help um, vet news requests for you, right? So we've worked with a lot of different reporters. We kind of know their quirks and can advise you. Um, if you haven't heard of a news outlet, we can help vet that for you. As we all know, especially these days, not all news outlets are equal. Um, just because you haven't heard of one, though, doesn't mean it doesn't have a huge reach um, and would be a great opportunity. On the other hand, one you might not heard of, and these are real life stories, could turn out to be state-owned Russian TV, um, which we don't need to do, uh, or um, sponsored articles, right? So a company hiring a writer to write a sponsored article, um, basically paid media. Um, but it's going to appear in the LA Times, and so you might think, hey, I'm being interviewed by the LA Times, but it's not, so we can help vet some of those things for you. Um, but we also would love for you to self-select the things you send us, right? So only you know, looking ahead six to 12 months, what papers you have coming out, and what are the most likely, the, the, the ones to have the biggest impact scientifically and be of the most interest to the lay public. So, if you're bringing me papers on your particular research area every month, and I did a press release on the first one, every subsequent one, I'm probably gonna say, you know, um, I don't think this is the right fit for a press release because we just covered this topic, right? So um, more is not always better when we're reaching out to press. Um, we don't wanna annoy our media contacts. Um, and it, it, too much just becomes noise and it's counterproductive. So self-select. The good news is there are lots of communication channels, right? So a press release is not the be all and end all. Um, if we are not gonna do a press release on something, sometimes we'll write a blog post. Um, our Tumblr blog has more than 100,000 subscribers. Our social media, Facebook and Twitter accounts together probably have 20,000 followers. So we have a built in audience that we can help you reach um, through many different avenues. Um, but again, green. Let us know about new papers before they are published. So we can start working on things before they're published. We do understand and follow journal embargo policies. Um, and this is how you can see an article come out. You see this all the time. Here's just a Discover article. You see study published today in science. 
Well, they can write an article about a study published today because they had a heads up ahead of time, um, either from the Journal of Public Information Office. Um, so I'm not going to go through this step by step. This is a little bit about how the sausage is made, but I want to give you an idea of all the things that have to go on behind the scenes in order to produce a press release and kind of the ideal amount of time before publication we would get to do each of those things, right? So um, we have to talk to you and hear in your own words about your research. Um, we draft the press release. You can take a first stab yourself if you want to, um, but we are here to do that for you. Um, we can coordinate with other institutions and departments. We have to have other people review. We will always share with you to review, same as um, the conversation. We're not going to put out a, anything if you, as the main researcher, are not happy with it. Um, and then this gives us time when it's all done several days before the embargo lifts and the paper publishes to begin pitching that to reporters and posting it on um, media distribution sites ahead of time. Um, so media distribution site, the main one being AAAS's Eureka Alert. So our, as we as an institution have a subscription to this that allows us to post our press releases, as do many, many other institutions and universities, and it's kind of a go-to place for science news. A great benefit is we can post things ahead of time while they're still under embargo, and then they're only accessible to credentialed journalists who have a login and agree to the embargo through Eureka Alert. So this is how we can all work together ahead of time without breaking the embargo so that everything can go live nicely on the day that the paper publishes. All right, so then quickly some tips on communicating your work um, to the media, but really to any lay audience. So remember your audience. They All they want to hear from the beginning is why should I care? So get to that factor of your research first. Um, you know, before going into details about some um, new material you're working on, if you're a materials engineer, first mention what that potential application for that is, right? Like connect it to my life before going into details. Um, use simple words, avoid acronyms. Of course, we know to not use technical jargon that people don't know. But I think in academia, we tend to use words that are overly fancy. So I have a coworker whose biggest pet peeve is when we write that something increased efficiency. And she always says, why don't you just say it works better, right? So just speak conversationally. Um, if you're enthusiastic about your work, um, the people listening to you will be more interested. Enthusiasm is infectious. Lead with your key points. Don't assume something is common knowledge. So I hear um, terms like cell signaling pathways and cell receptors thrown around all the time as though they're household terms, but they're not. Um, be conversational. Mention where you work. Work that in. A lot of news outlets, um, just for space and time, will drop off your affiliation, believe it or not. So it's not just for us, because we do want UC San Diego's name out there, but um, it also adds credibility to you. And remember, in the end, your written quote or soundbite is going to be very, very short. So scientists talking to other scientists looks like this. This is every paper and scientific presentation you've ever seen. We start with the background, then get down to the um, techniques, the rationale, the data. Here's what we did. And then end with, and here's what we found. Main findings, one, two, three. And perhaps the last one is the most significant. You want to completely flip that pyramid around when you're talking to non-scientists, right? Start with that main takeaway. Don't worry about spoilers. Go ahead and spoil it. What is the main takeaway? This is how I write um, press releases, right? I get out the, the who published this. What is the main finding? Where was it published? When was it published? Right, right, right away. Unfortunately, a lot of people are not going to read beyond your headline. So you have to get the main point out there and in the very first couple sentences. All right, now a couple other things to remember when talking to media. I'm not going to go through these one by one for the sake of time. But in short, anything you say can be quoted. Okay? Um, and editing is out of our hands. So whereas for when you're working with our office or with a conversation where you are part of the editing process and you get final say, that is not the case when you're working with um, say a newspaper or a magazine, okay? They have freedom of the press, they have a certain code of ethics, and a lot of them have policies to not show quotes or passages to um, sources before publication. Um, of course, if there is an, a factual mistake, we can ask for a correction. Um, don't be surprised that a good reporter will also find an outside expert to comment on your work, and again, we can't control who that is or what they may say. 
But my, my biggest takeaway when I'm doing media training is when in doubt, bridge back to what you know best. So um, if, if the reporter's sort of getting the conversation and the question's a little off topic, maybe it's not necessarily controversial. Maybe it's just that you're getting outside your area of expertise. Um, don't ever just say no comment. You know that that always sounds like you're hiding something. Um, but just bridge back. This is what politicians do when they're asked a question, but they'd rather stick to their talking points. Um, you say, great question. Um, but what I think is really important is X, Y, and Z. Get back to your talk. So that's my kind of takeaway point. Um, and then finally, again, just if you're interested in working with us, if you want us to know you, if you're contacted by uh, media, reach out to your public information office. Um, for us here, you can see Legal Health is our number, and there is a contact the journalist page on our website. It shows each of us. Um, each of us public information officers in the different beat areas that we cover. All right, thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Heather. Um, in the interest of time, um, I'm just gonna go straight in and to our question stage. So, um, bear with me. Okay, so, um, just as a quick reminder, um, in the uh, Zoom function, you can post questions in the chat. We've already got quite a few coming in. Um, you can also raise your hand, and if you'd like to ask a, a verbal question, from the American side, they've got a, a, a live audience, um, so questions will be being posed from the audience as well. Um, but if you would like to raise your hand, we can um, promote your microphone, and we can uh, get a verbal question off you. Brilliant. So, um, I might ask the, uh, the first question that's already um, come up, um, and it's towards uh, Michael. Um, so, it, going back to your um, presentation, th there, were, there was a question around, um, you, you sort of vetted some of the speakers for how good they would be at communicating. Yeah. Um, what was the kind of balance between good and bad speakers, to, to put it that way? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, there was there was a big difference. Um, you know, a lot of the time, uh, maybe maybe about twenty twenty percent, thirty percent of the time, um, a researcher wouldn't be able to explain their research um, well, or they. Um, uh, they wouldn't be interested in, in doing um, an interview, a recorded interview. So those were the real, the two main things that we were uh, looking out for. Um, if uh, if someone was really good, uh, that would come across as them being able to explain their area of research, which you know could often be um, technical um, in simple terms. So uh, you know, I was listening out for you know the type of language they were using. Um, but also, you know, whether they could um, say it in, you know, short sentences. Uh, that works really well for recorded interviews. You know, when people, um, you know, have really long protracted sentences, it makes a really difficult job of editing. Um, so, yeah, I guess those were the things I was looking out for. And, um, yeah, but the majority of the time, you know, researchers were, um, were quite good at explaining their work. And, um, you know, the interviews went, went really well. Brilliant. Okay. Well, um, I think that's quite a comprehensive answer. Um, we've got one more broad question um, that anyone can take. Um, so, this question is around um, both the ISBAN part and ISPAR societies. So, uh, the question says, we're, we're especially interested in disseminating research to countries where potentially our findings would be more impactful. Is there any information on how altmetrics and the conversation are looking into reaching these countries? And um, he just thanks us for the talk. So do you want me to go first? Well, I have the microphone, so I guess I will. Um, we, we actually have a, um, an, a ninth site uh, that really is in its own, but um, we do publish a newsletter called um, the, Co the Global Conversation. 
and that is for underserved communities uh, and 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 uh, and what are considered the global south. So we our content ends up in numerous countries um, that are not part of the the conversation uh, eight um, different sites. And so this is very important to us. As a matter of fact, the reason we got funding from the Carnegie Foundation, a Carnegie Corporation in New York, actually, uh, is to have our content, this very important content, especially in the area of health and medicine, reach um, those communities that don't typically um, you know, get access to this. So if anyone's interested, uh, I can, I'm happy to connect them with the editor of this section uh, who actually resides in New York City. But this is very important to our mission long term, which is why we continue to launch new conversations. Uh, and the more that we're able to bring content that can be shared around the globe, the better. So that would be something would be very easy to just connect with me and I will then send them to the right place. One, one other thing you might want to touch on is the fact that the conversation optimizes a lot of the publications that they, they produce to be republished. And the republishing can take place not only in the countries in which the research took place or where the conversation is located, but it gets republished much more broadly than that. I know an article that Tepi and I wrote republished in India and some other countries. So that's something that it does happen even when you are publishing in the conversation in the US, for example. Yeah, matter of fact, I mean, I can't pull it up on the screen, but um, we, you know, we, we've been republished in 157 different countries. So that, that absolutely is the case. And probably 30% of our content is republished in other countries. Brilliant. Thank you. I might do one more question from our side, John, if that's all right, because um, it's a, a really good question um, and one that the speakers might fight over. Um, Michael, you could perhaps answer it from your perspective of uh, being a PhD student, and um, Heather and uh, Bruce, you can answer it from your perspectives. Um, so the question is, um, what advice would you give to an early career researcher or a PhD student, perhaps, to help them persuade their more senior supervisors that public or media attention is a worthwhile pursuit? Um, okay. uh, Tough well, question. You might want to go first, Michael. Okay, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, so um, the main thing that I would say would be that it, it does directly feed into developing your skills as, a, as an academic and a researcher. Um, the main thing to say to your supervisor would be, this is going to help me write abstracts, um, and it's going to help me write my thesis. Um, you know, at the end of the day, when you're um, when you're putting abstracts together, what you're trying to do is you're trying to condense down a lot of information into simple uh, and a succinct um, terms. So, by doing science communication, writing articles, or you know, doing the likes of uh, three-minute thesis style competition, um, you're going to be honing those skills uh, that you can use in academia. Um, so yeah, there's a direct translation there. Um, so I'll just point that out to your supervisor. I actually really liked Bruce's slide with all those, um, the metrics on how they said what's happened after they published in the conversation and leading to um, new research collaborations or um, you know, um, funding, concrete things that, a, that, your, that your senior researcher, your mentor are really going to love. You can also point to lots of successful, well-respected scientists um, globally who are well-known science communicators as well. Brilliant. Well, I might hand over to America and to John if you want to take questions from the floor. We've got a few questions potentially from the floor here too, but you go first. Considered by the major scientists, how would one go about getting their stories considered by the conversation 
and is there ways to optimize the ability to get those inquiries considered? So um, if, if you go to the home site of just theconversation.com and whatever country you're in, uh, it will launch, if you're in any of the eight countries where we publish, um, your site will come up, not the US, but if you're publishing, if you're a scholar here in the US, uh, on the right hand column, um, when you go scroll down the right side, it will say pitch an idea and there's a form there that you fill out that makes it extremely easy. Um, but you have to first prove who you are, so you'll have to um, have to make sure you give all your credentials. Uh, and then when you pitch your idea, it gives you helpful hints about that, but it has to be short and sweet. And if there is interest, a the editor of that section will communicate back to you to say we're very interested, and then the, you know the the um, the collaboration begins at that stage. Uh, awesome. Thank you. To you. No more from your room, John. No questions from our room right now. Okay. Um, well, I think that's um, it from the online. Um, I'm just scrolling through. I think I've, I found oh, one more for for Michael. Um, so. The science competitions sound like a great initiative. Uh, do you know if these are recorded online to listen to, or where there might be some YouTube recordings or something like that? Um, and the, the um, question says that this might help people l learn how to practice for them and, and get involved with them. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I think most of the um, presentation style competitions will have the presentations recorded um, uh, if not um, all of the presentations, definitely you know the the finalist um, presentations. Um, but you know if you're if you know you're going to be involved in a in a competition and you're not sure, it's always worthwhile checking and um, even suggesting that it is recorded um, because it's a uh, the benefit of that is you can uh, link to the recording on your CV or whatever online platform you have. And, you know, it serves as a great, um, uh, it, yeah, it serves as a great resource to, to go back a, a, and do. And it's the same with, um, um, you know, written articles and, and things like that as well. Well, they'll, they'll all add up and you'll be able to, you know, link back to them. Um, and then I have one more comment to make if we're out of questions, something I forgot to say. I especially want to encourage women and women of color to make time to do these things and to um, make time for media interviews. I know uh, science journalists have said it often takes them, they have to reach out to twice as many women um, to get the same number of interviewees as they do men. Um, I don't know why that is. Um, and, you know, even here, I will often um, reach out to women saying, uh, you know, I have a report looking for an expert on this. Can you talk to them? And they often defer to their more senior male colleague. You don't have to be the world's leading expert in a very specific thing to be the right person to speak to media on a topic, right? Um, in fact, sometimes that person is not so good at putting it into a lay context. So please make the time to do that. It'll be good for you and for representation in general. Before we go, I'd like to make uh, one more comment. Is this, this is a short amount of time, to be honest with you, I do significant number of presentations uh, and 10 minutes is, is short. But one last thing that's really important, um, some of our best and most uh, you know, well-read content has come from postdocs um, and we work with a lot of them. Matter of fact, we do professional development on a number of the campuses that support the conversation. Uh, and matter of fact, there's a few groups where all the reason that they support us is so that we will our editors will go on campus and actually work with PhD students and candidates um, because that group is critically important to the conversation. The reason is they're born in this digital age and social media and what they're, you know, and, and, and offering to the public. Um, later career academics believe that this is um, not something they need to spend their time on. There are some that do, but, you know, where we get some of our best stories has been from the earlier career academics. And so for us, please pitch to us because um, you are the future 
and you are born in this era. And the more you do this, the better. And also to what Heather said, we are always trying to work, uh, figure out ways to get content from diverse authors, which we actually are doing a very good job with, but we're looking for more, so. Brilliant, thank you. Um, it's just one more question coming for Ewan, um, and it is around um, what, uh, what are the new avenues because I know that Altmetric is continually adding in uh, new metrics. Um, so what's the new things that we can expect to come um, in the coming months and years? Uh, well, uh, that's a good question. I mean, I can say what we've been focused on most recently, which is around um, things like patents. So, you know, is your research being picked up uh, potentially in a patent and then how is that patent being licensed and used in a product um, and then the other thing is around policy which I already kind of mentioned it's it's a bit difficult to kind of look ahead years because in some ways we're restricted by what data is available to us so you can have a really good idea for oh if, only, if we could track you know x that would be a really help us help give us a really good insight uh, into how the work is being disseminated but the problem is you know, we have to license all the data. We have to make an agreement with Twitter. We have to make an agreement with Facebook. You know, have to find a way of getting blogs with uh, licensing news content and all this kind of thing. So, unfortunately, to some degree, it's a bit uh, reactive rather than proactive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's um. It it is hard to predict, I suppose. And of course, there's always new channels coming out and new modalities. Um, the conversation obviously been um, a big, big one that's come out in the last 10 years um, and I'm sure there'll be more to come. Um, I haven't had any raised hands um, recently, so um, if, if that's it from questions your side and questions online, I may um, just do a quick wrap up. Just confirm that, John. Absolutely. I just but before you do a quick wrap up, I'll, I'll do a quick wrap up on this end as well. And I just wanted to thank our speakers for coming out today, both the ones that are here live at UCSD and all the audience members that came out live here to UCSD to uh, join us for this webinar. Um, I also want to thank the funders here um, at the University of San Diego, uh, UC San Diego School of Medicine, and the UC San Diego School of Medicine. Um, Center for Excellence in Women's Health, uh, who, who definitely provided us with some excellent support from Alan and um, to, to, to make this happen. So I'll send it to you, Tepi, with a final thank you also to the online presenters, Michael and Ewan. Brilliant. Thank you, John. Yeah, and uttering that from our side uh, is part Early Career Network. Really like to thank all of the speakers. Um, we just have a quick few points. So. In the, um, in the chat feature, I've just posted a quick link uh, to a short evaluation survey. So the survey that we ran for our last webinar, which was only recently, um, hopefully um, we've acted on quite a bit of that feedback. Um, and hopefully it's been a, a, a really good experience for everyone online as well as in person um, in America. Um, I would urge you uh, to join ISPAR and the Early Career Network um, particular um, and join our events at the ISPAR 2018 Congress if you are coming. Um, and a basically final big thank you to America uh, and particularly to John for hosting from your side. It's um, been a pleasure to do the triple hosting of this webinar and get such a fantastic lineup together. Um, that's it from me. Thanks very much, everyone. Right back at you, Debbie. Big thank you to you as well. That's a wrap.